Dr. Wee Eng Yong is an Associate Professor and Deputy Director of the Signature Research Program in Emerging Infectious Diseases at Duke NUS Graduate Medical School. He graduated from the University of Nottingham with a degree in medicine. After completing his housemanship, he embarked on his PhD studies at the National University of Singapore under the mentorship of Emeritus Professor Chan Soha, also a clinician scientist. After completing his PhD, he has worked on dengue. His research is positioned at the interface between clinical epidemiology, virology and immunology of dengue. His work has explained the re-emergence of dengue in Singapore despite the continued effort to suppress the mosquito vector population. Current research focus is directed at understanding dengue pathogenesis and the molecular basis of immunity. At what point of time do you decide that you want to become a researcher? I, I got interested in research in medical school because we had to do a compulsory research year and that was my first taste of research. Uh, but the, 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 the decision to go into research uh, was, was actually, I think, made when I was doing my housemanship here in Singapore. Uh, I felt that, you know, there, the, a lot of medicine was all about treating diseases symptomatically. We weren't dealing with the root cause. Um, and, and the reason why we weren't dealing with the root cause is because we don't really understand of, or don't fully understand uh, pathogenesis at the molecular level. And so that was what I decided to do, to come back and understand the disease at a molecular level so that we can then translate to new ways of preventing diseases and new treatments. At the point you made your decision, how adequate did you feel? Well, I had, I had the benefit of a third year research, uh, a full, well, a year or nine months worth of research as a medical student. So I had some idea about how research ought to be done. Um, but nonetheless, the going to a PhD was daunting. It was, uh, um, you know, it was a whole new area, I guess, in, in terms of the depth that I had to get into. Um, but I had a wonderful mentor to, to guide me uh, and, uh, you know, to learn not only the lab skills, but also the thinking skills to be successful in, uh, in research. Um, so it was daunting, but I had, I had good guidance. During the early part of your career, what challenges did you face that made it difficult? The, one of the um, the things that I really had to grapple with initially was that my friends were earning so much more than I was because I, I went from uh, you know being a qualified doctor back to being a PhD student uh, and and uh, so that was that was something that was you know tough but you know, it's not insurmountable it was, it was just something that I had to grapple with and get used to uh, subsequent to that I mean with, with other research it was a matter of uh, getting it all set up uh, so that you know, we had all the materials to do the research, you had all the infrastructure, you had the right tools and all that, and put all those things in place. So that took a bit of ed, you know, effort, a bit of energy. Uh, and once everything was in place, it was, it was a matter of then just you know, asking the right questions and churning out the right answers. How have the challenges you faced evolved as you have rose through the ranks? For me, the uh, success in research really depended uh, on collaboration. So, uh, besides setting up my own lab I mean, the, to make sure that I, you know, the research was, was uh, involved both the bench as well as the clinics and patients and all that, I had to have collaborators because I couldn't be seeing patients and doing the bench work uh, or you know, the research work myself. Um, and, and as I rose in the years I spent in research, um, I, I got to have some really uh, fantastic collaborators. Right? Uh, chief among which right now is uh, Dr. Jenny Lau in, in, uh, in SGH. Uh, she's a senior consultant infectious disease physician, so we have a lot of uh, collaborations on, on, um, on dengue and doing clinical trials with dengue and prospective studies with patients with dengue. So that, that collaboration has been really, really fruitful. Uh, on the lab side, I've also got great colleagues here in, in Duke and US. Um, so I collaborate with them and many of them are far more molecularly oriented than I am. Uh, perhaps I'm, I'm a little bit more, um, I look at the problems at a, a bigger picture level, at the epidemiological level, and then try and understand some of these things at the molecular level. But you know, right next door to me is someone who is really asking how does one molecule talk to another molecule and what happens. And, and when you combine these different ideas and, and, and resources together, you can actually go somewhere really interesting. So how did you cope with your challenges and who were your reference points? So I had a, a, a wonderful mentor when I was doing my PhD, and that was uh, Professor Chan Soha. He's an emeritus professor in the US right now. 
uh, when, when I worked with him, he was then the head of microbiology uh, department in NUS. He himself was a clinician scientist, so I had a role model that I could look to. Um, and you know, essentially, he taught me the, what it you know, takes to, to be successful in research, you know, how to build the collaborations, how to identify uh, problems. You've know, got to know when the, you can solve the problem yourself and when you can't solve the problem yourself. When is it better to, to look uh, for someone else to help and, and, who, and how do you pick these people? Uh, so so I, I guess uh, you know, but the answer to that is I, I, I owe a lot to, to that mentor and he's uh, you know, very much taught me everything that I... A lot of what I know actually came from him. What scientific work are you proud of? Well, two things come to mind. Uh, firstly, when I uh, moved my research, um, uh, when I started as an in independent investigator after my PhD, I, I, you know, at that time it coincided with the at that time the largest outbreak in dengue uh, of dengue in Singapore in 1998. Right. So the question then was that why was Singapore still having dengue even though they spent so much effort controlling the mosquito? So that was my research interest, and, and I'm particularly proud that you know, I was able to do a few things. One is we understood how this dengue re-emerged in Singapore despite the vector control, right? And we've put some of those things down on paper. I mean, primarily we think that it's a combination of herd immunity. Uh, I think the vector control program has also changed the, the pattern of transmission somewhat. Uh, and finally, the, probably the biggest contributor now is that adults and not children are getting dengue. And dengue in adults uh, cause a number of different things. One, the disease itself is slightly different. Two, is that uh, amongst those that are infected, proportionately more of them actually have symptomatic disease. Right? And because adults work, and so they, they need to go to a, a doctor to get a medical certificate to get off work, then the, the surveillance system picks these cases up more than if these would happen to children and they would just have stayed at home. Right. So because of that, then you, the, the more cases are reported and so you get more cases in the 90s and then in the early 2000s now, even though there's vector control. Um, so I, I think you know, understanding why Singapore has, has uh, this re-emergence of dengue has, is important not only for Singapore because then we need to understand how to deal with it, but also for the rest of, of the world because uh, Singapore is always often looked to as the model to control dengue, right? And so, you know, papers argue that the vector control should be done the way Singapore does it. But then, if you have a re-emergence of dengue despite the vector control, then I might argue for it, you know, that you know this is really not worth doing. So, understanding why it re-emerged uh, is, is, I think, critical to driving uh, the, the next step as to how, okay, what do, what next do we do? Right. So that's one piece. And I think the other piece that of work that we that we're doing now that I, I think is pretty exciting is where you know because of the 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 reemergence of dengue in Singapore, uh, despite this vector control, it argues also for a vaccine to make things to make dengue prevention more sustainable. Um, but the dengue vaccine is limited by our lack of un complete understanding of immunity, the basis of immunity. So, so I think our lab has you know, identified that as a problem. Uh, so we've kind of moved from epidemiology now into more fundamental science to try and understand immunity. And we've begun that process. So we have identified that antibodies, besides just blocking virus from attaching to cells or, and getting into cells, it does a second or uh, another effect. It has, it's also able to aggregate these viruses to form immune complex. When it does that, it's interacting with F different receptors on the cell. The outcome is completely different. And by understanding how neutralization is, is, is made by these antibodies, uh, I think we can come to a, one, a better test for immunity, and two, we, we know what, what, kind of, uh, what kind of immunity a vaccine must uh, trigger in order to provide long-lasting immunity. So that work is ongoing right now, and, and that's what, something that we're, we're quite excited about. What gives you the buzz to continue what you're doing? Translating the science into medicine. Um, you know, I think the, the, you know, the uh, fun in research is actually to be able to attain the knowledge that would change the way we're practicing medicine uh, today. So for example, you know, there is no vaccine against dengue. 
Right? So having a vaccine is going to fundamentally change the way we prevent dengue. I think, you know, one is that vector control we know today is very, very expensive. So in Singapore, it costs us 60 over million a year to control one, you know, couple of species of mosquito uh, that prevents maybe one or two diseases. Um, have, if you have a vaccine, then, you know, the, the countries that cannot afford a, a vector control might still be able to prevent dengue. Right? If, if the vaccine is cheap enough, you can vaccinate uh, children. Um, so doing the science that then enables the development of such a vaccine or even working with companies, which is happening to us right now because of what we have done, we began, began to be, be able to test immunity in a more specific way. So we've begun a collaboration with uh, a, pharma, a vaccine manufacturer to, to do this. So having, being able to do this and see that vaccine move slowly but hopefully surely into uh, um, licensing and eventually implementation uh, is, 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 you know, is gratifying. So in, in retrospect, what would you do differently if you could go back in time? Uh, not a whole lot. Um, I think um, uh, if, if, if there's perhaps one thing that I, I would have liked maybe is to have, be, have been able to do my uh, PhD in MBBS all at the same time, so in like an MD-PhD as opposed to breaking up into two separate parts. Um, so, and the reason why I say that is I, I think, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said for youthful energy uh, during the PhD years. You know, the, 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 because one, it, is, it requires a bit of stamina, and two, I think, you know, that uh, the most productive time is when you're in your early 20s, when you're most imaginative and not constrained by, you know, too much knowledge or too much reality. Um, so, you know, if anything uh, I would have done over again or have liked to do over again, that night might be it. But beyond that, I, I don't have um, much regrets in what has happened. I'm really satisfied with what has happened.